Hi, we are now in the office of Halyar Aksnes. Hello, Halyar. Hello. You have led a research project with the title Music, Motion and Emotion. In this title, you connect emotions with motions or movement. Can you explain the connection? Yes. Um, I've always been fascinated by the etymological connection between motion and emotion. What is the reason why we have put the prefix e in front of motion to describe how we feel? And I think that has a lot to do with the fact that emotions are temporal, they are dynamic, they move through time. We can feel a surge of anger, for instance. <laughs> we all have felt that feeling. Uh, and it's very easy to uh, conceptualize emotions in term of motion. And that is in fact also a very central metaphor for the understanding of music, that we cannot understand music almost invariably. We use metaphors of motion and space and time, movement through space when we describe music. And uh, it's quite fascinating because music is in fact just a constellation of sound waves. And how is it that we imbue these sound waves with such a richness and heterogeneity of meaning? That is precisely through metaphors of motion and the emotions they evoke uh, give rise to more metaphors. And as you understand, I've been working a lot with cognitive metaphor theory, which is a uh, discipline within cognitive science where one focuses on the fact that even literal uh, meanings in language are in fact metaphorically based. For instance, if we say, I'll meet you at the foot of the mountain, mm -hmm. uh, we understand intuitively that that's the bottom of the mountain. So the and mountain doesn't have a foot there? No. It doesn't actually have a foot. <laughs> well, in the fairy tales it yeah. does. They make very much use of these metaphors. And we do so in, in music as well. We understand music in terms of motion in space. Mm. But it is in fact just sound waves mm. uh, vibrating in the, in the air. But would you say it's connected to human movement then? Certainly. That, that is one of the uh, tenets of cognitive metaphor theory, that we use uh, our experiences mm -hmm. as embodied human beings in a physical world where we are subject to physical forces like gravity, for instance. Mm -hmm. We use these experiences to understand more abstract things like language, poetry, uh, music. For instance, uh, if we look at uh, the, the notion of balance, that is something we all intuitively understand when we speak of emotional ba balance, for instance, or psychological balance. We can say she's completely out of balance and everybody understands what that means. And there we make use of what uh, Lakoff and Johnson call image schemata, image schemas, which are skeletal forms of structure that are Amodal. They, they are independent of the sensory modalities like vision, hearing, mm -hmm. uh, the tactile sense, the kinesthetic sense, which is knowing where the body is, the muscles and joints. And these amodal image schemas, they are used to make a sense out of more abstract phenomena, like, for instance, feelings or music. We also use the notion of balance to understand music very much. For instance, the music of Palestrina is heard by many people and Palestrina scholars and during the Renaissance period as something that is exceptionally balanced. Mm. And that is something we intuitively understand that the up and down are in equilibrium, uh, the, uh, and especially up and down there in Palestrina, he has he has a melodic motion where he can make leaps up and then stepwise downwards. There we make use of a sort of feeling of a potential energy, mm -hmm. which is a physical phenomenon. When we lift something up, this book for instance, we give it potential energy, which is then, oh. now it's back to zero, <laughs> uh, thanks to gravity. 
And uh, we use gravitational metaphors to understand music as well. Um, and that is another way of understanding balance. And then you have the temporal balance and the balance of tempo. For instance, Stravinsky, who changes metrum the whole time. He goes from three-fourths to four-fourths to two-fourths, and it has this stumbling effect. It's like we're constantly shifting our center of balance, and that makes us very awake in his music. Uh, I wanted to ask you that a lot of melancholic, uh, sad music we recognize it as melancholic. We, it's very often in a, in a slow tempo. Do you yes. think that's a coincidence? Certainly not. <laughs> um, I have myself focused on, for instance, Dido's Farewell from uh, Purcell's opera Dido and Aeneas, which is in a very, very slow tempo, and there's a repetitive uh, pattern in the instruments. It's like ruminating over these sad thoughts. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, studies of depressed patients show that they have a slower perception of time. Mm -hmm. they, they think their whole, and their body, their pulse, everything goes more slowly. Mm -hmm. And we all have loved ones around us, and we can sense immediately if they're happy or sad, if we talk to them on the phone. Yeah. And there's this tone of voice. Uh, if you're sad, yes. the voice yeah, is subdued and <laughs> goes down. And yes, <laughs> we have the downward motion, mm. just like the mouth mm. goes down. And if they're happy, they're excited oh, yeah. and they're talking fast and in a much higher register. Right. And of course, we use those kinds of uh, icons of feeling in music. music too.